uh, welcoming you about how not to get hacked um, or rugged and a life-saving lesson. So to my left, I've got uh, Charles. Please uh, tell us a bit about yourself and what you do uh, within, uh, within your company. Yeah. Hello, everyone. So I'm Charles Guimet. I'm CTO at Ledger. Uh, Ledger is a, a leader in uh, security technology for holding and managing cryptocurrency. Um, the, it's, it's well known for the hardware wallet industry. We, we, we have sold more than 5 million devices, the nano, uh, nano devices, but we also have an, uh, a solution for a financial institution which is called uh, Ledger Vault. Uh, as of today, we estimate that uh, between 15 and 20% of the market cap is secured uh, inside Ledger devices. Um, and my background is around cryptography and security and uh, software engineering in general. Excellent. Welcome. And Joshua. Hi, everybody. My, my fellow countrymen. Yep. Here we go. <laughs> I'm, I'm here all the way from San Francisco. Uh, my name is Joshua Goldbard. I founded a company called MobileCoin. MobileCoin makes an end-to-end -end encrypted cryptographic payment system. We've actually distributed our software into roughly 250 million devices, including very likely the one in your pocket right now. Our technology is available today inside of Signal Messenger, where you can send an end-to-end -end encrypted payment in five seconds or less. Thank you very much. And last but not least, Sasha, hello. Welcome. Hi, everyone. My name is Sasha, the CEO and founder of TrustBlock. Our goal is to provide and relay security data to the whole ecosystem, first to the app interfaces in the form of labels that highlights the, highlights the more trustworthy projects, and uh, secondly, to smart contracts so they can autonomously integrate and intercommunicate inter between each other. Fantastic. Welcome, guys. And by the way, you do notice like an American, French, American. We're not doing like a World <laughs> Cup off, but we will probably be having some good, solid debates in our rusty conversation. But let's just kick off uh, just for anyone in the room that might not be that familiar with cryptocurrencies about, you know, what is it exactly? You know, where did it start? Kind of who is using it nowadays? And um, Josh, I'm looking to you first, if you don't mind giving a yeah. little bit of a description here. So the pursuit of digital cash is actually roughly like 30, 40 years old. There have been a number of different cryptographic attempts to make something that basically was a way to spend money over the internet and over networks that preceded the internet. In 2008, Satoshi Nakamoto developed what we describe as Nakamoto consensus, and this was the foundation of Bitcoin. And Bitcoin, as I think everybody in this room is aware, is a way of sending money over the internet that is provable in a decentralized fashion. Now, over the last 14 years, we've seen development of lots of different protocols that improve upon this Nakamoto consensus idea to bring new innovations to the blockchain. Some of these are for recording information, some of these are for sending payments, but all of them involve interacting with information over the internet in a permanent manner. And this is actually the thing that is different about cryptocurrency, is this concept of digital permanence. Digital permanence, say that 10 times fast. Maybe not now, we'll wait for the drinks. Um, but thinking about like who are the core years, users and where it's going, um, Sasha, what, what have you learned kind of around this evolution uh, bringing us to present day? Yeah, I guess there are many kind of different users using actually cri cryptocurrencies. First, uh, first goal is to provide like uh, currencies that are usable in the real world, you know, to uh, people that don't have access to banks or yeah. uh, good currencies, however, but um, other kind of users are financial. I think there are so many things happening in the financial side in cryptocurrencies. Uh, technological, because it's a challenge to scale technically what's happening in the cryptocurrencies. And the last one are ethical ones, I guess. The, want, the people really want decentralization, privacy, yeah. all that kind of stuff that mm, has been taken away from users uh, since the internet. Uh, really boomed out. Exactly. And Charles, when we just met moments ago in the beautiful Samsung Lounge, you've not been there, check it out. They got watermelon. They got three varieties of water, watermelon, strawberry, and lemon. So I do adv advance, advise you to pop over. We were talking about kind of the, the, the revolution of the value of blockchain and, you know, what that means exactly for a user to kind of guard their own security. So, so let's, let's talk about the revolution of the value first. Sure. That's okay. Um, yeah, blockchain and cryptocurrency uh, come with a new paradigm. I think it's a revolution of value. It's a revolution of ownership. Uh, when you hold fiat at your bank, you actually own an IOU. When you want to use your pound or your dollars or your euro, you have to ask the permission to your banker to uh, use your uh, money. 
With crypto, it's very different. With crypto, you really own your value. You really own your data. And it changes it change everything. When you own Bitcoin, your Bitcoin are actually on the blockchain. What you actually own is a private key. Your private key allows you to prove your ownership over your Bitcoin. Whenever you want to make a transaction, you will prove using cryptography that you own this Bitcoin and you consent to send X Bitcoin to this specific address. So it's a shift in the security challenges because when you, you, when you own this private key, if ever you lose your private key, you lose your money. If ever an attacker gets an access to this private key, it will drain your wallet and there is nothing you can do. It's, uh, it's the permanence. The blockchain is immutable. That means that there is no one who can revert the transaction. You cannot go to the bank and say, I didn't consent for this transaction. You give me back your money, my money. This is not something possible. The, the blockchain is immutable. That's why we have a big security challenges with uh, the, the management and, the, and storing the, the crypto and uh, cryptocurrency and, uh, and, and digital assets. And then what does it mean for a user to be guarding their own security behind this? Yeah, guarding, owning crypto means securing your private key and securing it is a, a challenge. And this is what we uh, are doing at Ledger. We are using proven technology based on hardware, like smart card technology, HSM. Uh, we are using this technology in order to, um, to guard your crypto so that your, your key always stays uh, inside an enclave. Mm -hmm. And whenever you want to uh, make a transaction, you have a trusted display allowing you to verify what you are about to consent. Got you, right. So uh, within this little section, and Joshua, you, you explained that the, the descriptions around blockchain so well. Uh, do you mind just kind of summarizing you know, like what a rug is and what a hack is and yeah. those differences? And then let's start to deep dive into our present day. Sure. Yeah. So when you're interacting with cryptocurrencies or smart contracts, you have some level of trust that the person who wrote that software actually did it correctly. So the first thing that you have to make sure is that this software is actually doing what it, what it intends, intends to, do. to do. Just like if you're running a computer, computer program, program on your computer, computer and you, don't and you don't understand, understand what, it's, what supposed it's supposed to do, that program could tamper with your computer. This is also possible in cryptocurrency. So it's important to have some check that the software is actually doing what you think it's doing. Now, part of the problem is that the set of people who are capable of actually checking whether a cryptocurrency contract is correct is very small. And so we rely on auditors, we rely on different players in the industry, and we rely on sort of reputational proof that these contracts are actually doing what they're supposed to do. In the event where a contract is not written correctly, you can actually lose a great deal of money. And so some people um, take advantage of this fact and they will actually steal people's money. This is what's known as a rug. This is where people invest in some uh, concept and then the money that they invest is taken away. This is different from a hack. So a hack is where you lose possession of the funds that's on your device. This could be somebody physically getting possession of the device that has the, the money. This could be somebody remotely attacking it. There's a variety of ways, just like you can get your computer hacked. And so it's important that you use technology like Ledger for, as one example that helps to prevent these sorts of hacks. Now, there is no cure-all. There's no sort of like magic thing that instantly solves this. You still have to manage your passwords correctly. You still have to be smart about the way you use this technology. But you can protect yourself by knowing that you're using the right smart contracts and the right hardware to secure your money. Does that answer? That's brilliant. Thank you very much. Hopefully, we are thinking of some questions. We're going to get to the end of it. But um, now, moving to kind of present day, and a big reason why we're here discussing the, on this session together, um, Sasha, from your perspective, like what have you seen uh, in real world use cases and examples from, from your, your own experience? So, in my experience, what happens a lot of the time, which is not technically related, is basically that. Uh, something that is really easy to perform is making fake audits reports, for example. And uh, it's happening to a lot of users, you know, to check a project and they think it is audited. So they, they do their own research and basically they think, oh, this contract is secure, so I'm going to invest in it. And basically it was a fake PDF. And it's really easy to take a PDF that already exists yeah. and just modify it. And easier enough, easier, even, even easier than that is uh, making a fake website 
like it takes only five minutes you take the website of an auditor and you just uh, modify what's in it to say that your project was secure um, and it happens a lot of the time so I guess it's really hard you know to uh, prove the authenticity of an audit and a security right. assessment um, on the other side what really uh, also happens a lot of the time and um, Joshua mentioned it is basically uh, you know trusting uh, you have to place your trust in uh, centralized sources right. um, and it's really hard because um, there are not like if there's a reputation game going on and uh, background checking the reputation of someone that audited a contract is not easy al also yeah. because you have to be really knowledgeable of the ecosystem and not all users that come if we reach for mass adoption in Web3 we cannot expect for all the users yeah. to be knowledgeable about the reputation of each auditors so uh, what's, what's uh, really hard in my experience is the and the most important thing to do is the door the door is the main thing you should do before going into any project uh, you should draw the ecosystem and then you should draw the project so the more you will know about the project and the team also because the team is a big part you know crypto crypto is all about community it's all about teams right. so uh, if the team doesn't seem mature enough you know to uh, take on a project that you want to invest in it's a really bad signal basically yeah. because uh, if they don't respond in a much way if they accuse you of fud if you found something shadowy while investigating the project that's really uh, like a cue that you should listen to to not invest in the project yeah I guess. exactly and i think about we're talking about like mer you know remedial things that a user could be doing so is that like investigating the team something that an average user can do and how, how do they, yeah. So much of crypto is actually reputational. This is in stark contrast to the beginning of cryptocurrency where no one has any idea who Satoshi Nakamoto is. But today, if you're bringing up a new project online, if it's a completely anonymous team, it's actually something that's like a very dangerous signal as to whether or not this is going to be something viable. And so a lot of the new projects, they rely on the reputation of the team to help people to trust them. So what I find really interesting about this is that we spent so much time making decentralized technology for the specific purpose of not having control of the networks and not having the ability for um, you know, bankers or people like that to be able to take it over. And the problem with that is that decentralized technology is actually really hard for people to use most of the time. And so there ends up being these trade-offs where you want to make something that's really easy for people to use, and you also want all the benefits of decentralization. So I think what a lot of projects are trying to figure out right now is how do you make something that just works that's still decentralized? And what does that mean? This is something that we think about every day, and I know Ledger's doing a lot of thinking about that as well. Yeah, and uh, what, about, what about that, Charles? Like, you know, yeah. on, on like a day-to-day -day basis and also um, you know, how, do, how are scammers using these kind of new innovations and what I'll are the low-hanging fruits? I'll, I'll just say really quickly, yeah, jump in. it's super hard for a normal person to hang on to a really long password. Like, it's really hard. The set of people that are capable of hanging on to like a very long password for a long period of time is quite small. And so you have to do things to help people not lose their money in spite of this fact. Mm. Yeah, they covered very well the threats associated with the smart contract and the, and the blockchain, wh what runs actually on the blockchain. But there is also uh, another th uh, threat which is more simple, is how you do uh, secure your private key. And as of today, frankly, we are at the very beginning because what we can see on the field is scammers. We have plenty yeah. of scammers trying to, uh, to scam people. And as it's a new paradigm, it's difficult to handle for new users. Um, people get scammed uh, because it's low hanging fruit. You don't, you don't need a lot of knowledge to build a fake website asking the user for his 24 words. The 24 words is the human representation of these private keys. As I often say, the easiest way to uh, find someone's passwords is to kindly ask him. And this is what, what happens about, uh, about private key and, uh, and, um, and 24 words. The, the scammers simply make a fake website asking them gently for uh, the, their private keys. 
And unfortunately, for now, this works. Um, it reminds me like the beginning of the 2000s when we started to have um, online online bank accounts, and then uh, there, there was some uh, login and password, and th at this time people didn't know that they, they, there was this uh, HTTPS thing. That was the beginning. We we learned now. For now, we we understood that we have to verify the URL and so on. But for blockchain, there, there, there's our new mechanism, new uh, new things. But as of now, low only foots are are working well for scammers, so they continue to do that. Also, we start to see some targeted attacks. Uh, some people are very wealthy in, in the ecosystem, and they are targeted by attackers. And we, we can see, for instance, some uh, SIM swap attack. Uh, sim swap I've been SIM swap twice. <laughs> Have you now? I've SIM swap twice. Maybe you can explain how yes. SIM swap yeah, works. So, um, this so is it's actually really funny to me, because I, I worked in telecom for like 10 years. So <laughs> I, I've known about SIM swaps for a really long time. The name on my account is do not port this phone number. That's literally the name on my phone account. And You've given out your secrets away now. Well, but, <laughs> but it's, it doesn't stop anybody from porting the number. Like yeah. somebody goes to someone who works at a retail location, and you know those people are making minimum wage, and you pay them like a couple hundred dollars, and they'll just swap the SIM card. And now that person that has that SIM card swap has mm -hmm. your phone number. And if you use your phone number as the recovery for your cryptocurrency, there's no security to doing that. So we've had to make new technology, again, like Ledger, things like that, where it's more than just your phone number that secures your cryptocurrency. Because the reality is phone, phone numbers are not secure. So that is a, just a difficulty in life. So I've personally experienced that a couple times. It's very frustrating. You're like hanging out, and then all of a sudden your phone doesn't connect anymore. And you try to make a phone call, and it says this and line. And nothing to do with storage either. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and your phone, you try to make a phone call, and it says your phone is disconnected. And you call the phone company, and they say, oh, well, you came into the retail store and changed your phone to a different <laughs> phone. And you just have this moment of like, oh, Again? There, there goes like three <laughs> days of my life, you know, <laughs> right? So you have, you have scammers for longing foods. We have uh, targeted attacks with SIM swap and other kind of attacks like this. And also we have criminal organization going for big money and attacking exchanges and big financial institutions. There are a couple of them in the world, but they are very powerful. We can mention like uh, uh, East, okay, let's throw some names down. East Europe uh, Mafia, but also Lazarus, Lazarus which, is co which, which comes from uh, North, North Korea. Korea yeah. And they are very, very good at hacking exchanges and financial institutions. So for now, we have the, the ecosystem is like this, like scammers for low on fruits. It works very well, unfortunately. We have like more targeted attacks with uh, middle range at attackers. And we have big criminal organization targeting uh, financial institution. And at the end, it's, uh, it's a lot of money. Right, but even a, from a small, you know, one person to a very large organization, there has to be more protocol in place. There has to be more safety in place, which is what we're here to discuss now. I mean, what other examples are you thinking of as, as far as, you know, these types of attacks that have been happening that are at a very high level? Um... I think that, yeah, there are a lot of attacks happening. But um, like, as I mentioned, I, I guess that right now what happens the most in the ecosystem is that there is a lack of Jor and there is a lack of sources to Jor well, actually. Yeah. Like, um, I, as I began in the crypto ecosystem investing like a few years ago, uh, everyone was saying, OK, check the audit. That's the basic stuff you have to do, like, guess, like go to the auditor website to check it. But I was like, OK, so I check it now. I don't understand all the stuff because I'm not knowledgeable about what's happening. And uh, at the end, I just noticed, and this was the beginning. Maybe this will sound ob obvious to most of the people here. But uh, I noticed that there was a scope. So basically, there was a scope on a specific comet. So what, what do I do? Should I just like pull off the, all of the audited st stuff, you know, all the code, and just diff check it with the, what's uh, deployed? And then I have to be sure that the interaction I will be you know pushing to the network is the same as the one that are the the smart contracts that are inside the audit. So, I guess yeah. that most of the attacks are like we have like great uh, people building great tools such as Ledger and Mobile Coin, all that stuff. I think that there is a part which uh, in a, in a project that defends users from big attacks, from big hacks. But most of the exploits happen under like weird or simpler second senses, you know? Like you just do the wrong transaction. And I guess that one of the main problems is that 
uh, decentraliz de decentralization is the best thing ever, and uh, that's, thing, uh, that's why we are here, I guess. But um, the tech is kind of reflecting on the product, and I think that one thing we should do is enabling security by default, like highlighting the more trustworthy and secure project uh, instead of just being neutral about everything. So there's a bit of UX UI. I know that's very opinionated, and not everyone has the same uh, opinion on that. Well, but, I'll, uh, I'll give you a great example. Yeah. People don't think in long 64-bit characters. They don't think in cryptocurrency addresses. No one does. So what we need to do is have an addressing system that's like a phone number or a name. And until we have that kind of ability to send to a phone number or a name or something that isn't just like a very long string of characters, you're going to constantly have people getting their money stolen. We have to make human interfaces. This is something that we spent a great deal yep. of time at, on at MobileCoin. So we made a wallet for your cell phone. And it's built into Signal Messenger. And the way you send money is you type a phone number in. So you don't even ever see the cryptocurrency wallet at any point in the transaction. And what that means is that it's a lot harder to mess it up. It's a lot harder to accidentally send the money to somebody you don't know because you know the person's phone number that you're interacting with. So I think this is a huge thing that crypto can get better at. And it's a thing that the industry is actually starting to care about for the first time in you know, the last 15 years. So that's something I'm really excited about is watching the user interface improvements that make it easier to not get your money stolen. Yeah, what, 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 speaking of those, the, you know, other things that a user could be doing you know, after an attack happens to them, after a hack, after a rug, is there any, is there any other advice that you could be giving or <sighs> other things that... It's, you got your shaking head there, dude. I mean, if, it's not like... Yeah. If, if you get money stolen from a, like, you know, if somebody breaks into your house, you might have a security camera and maybe you get enough information that you can recover yeah. the money. Um, it's very hard to recover money in cryptocurrency. It does happen. There are times where large amounts of money get stolen and it gets recovered. But more often than not, if you get your money stolen in cryptocurrency, it's very hard to get it back. And this is something the industry is always working on and trying to yeah. do better at. Yeah. So it's putting up the bars, putting up the systems in place. Yeah. What are those cross checks? What are those other systems? You know, uh, you know, kind of thinking, thinking again how we're moving forward, and you know, how do we talk about what's to come and where crypto is going? And what's how to come is to make it hard to lose your money. R making it hard to lose your money. Lose exactly. Your money. Right. And then what? What? What is that next step so people don't lose their money? Yeah, I totally agree with uh, what you just said. If you only build a secure, a secure system for security, no one will, will use it. And, yep. and it's, it does, uh, it, you, you, you don't achieve anything. So They're that's humans, why right? We have yeah. to make human yeah. technology. That's why UX is, uh, is as important as, te as uh, the technology itself and security. And, uh, and I agree, like addresses are a big pain point. The 24 words private keys I uh, explained to you just before is also a, a pain point. And we, we need to address this, this pain point in order to make uh, the crypto use uh, easier and thus more secure. Yeah, Sasha. It comes together. Yeah, just quick, quick oh, sorry, show of yeah. hands. Who knows somebody that has lost cryptocurrency? <laughs> Holy <laughs> right. moly. Right. That's more than 50% of It them. is a horrible feeling. Like yeah, you, you have your friends who are like, oh, I forgot my password. I just lost 50 Bitcoins. Maybe that happened 10 years ago and it wasn't that much money. I have a friend who lost 50 Bitcoins by typing a transfer wrong by one character. And then what happened? It's gone. It's just gone. And it's a horrible feeling. We have to. Were you with that person when it happened? I, I talked to him the next day. Okay. And what, what I feel is that as technologists, we have a moral duty to prevent that from happening. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that, that is the, the crossover between, you know, humans and technology and, you know, leaning in to each other. And, like, when are these standards going to come into play? When are yeah. some international, you know, frameworks taking shape? So I'm sure you guys sit on some other committees and, and, uh, well, you Industry know, like, recognized when, bodies. When cars came out, they didn't have seat belts, right? Right. And you know, they didn't—they didn't really have windshields in the beginning either. Right. And over time, you add features mm -hmm. in that make it safer. Yeah. And you know, that's just what we have to do in crypto. Right. So, are are there industry recognized standards being created? Yeah. So, so, are we able to talk about that or name drop any well, systems coming into play? Well, NIST has uh, blockchain security standards. There are yeah. a couple different organizations that are actually creating these. Yeah. But more often than not. 
Companies like Ledger, they're ahead of the standards. They're like far yeah. ahead. And, and MobileCoin also tries to be ahead of the standards. They got Ledge in their name. You know, they're going <laughs> to... Right. Ledger right. as a so standard. That's it. Ledgy McLedge <laughs> face. Ledger. <laughs> it, but in a way, I th it, sorry, that, I say that with love. I think, uh, you know, it, uh, is there a point that governments will come into play? Or do you think this is just going to be within our communities? Of I started <laughs> MobileCoin five years ago. And if you told me I'd be five years into this and we still <laughs> wouldn't have legislation in America, I would have told you you're crazy. But where we are right now is that we're all waiting for legislation. We all know it's coming. Yeah. yeah. And we just we just want it to be legislation that doesn't kill the industry. Yeah. Exactly. Which, which helps users, which uh, protects users, yeah, but yeah. not kill the innovation and not kill the industry. Exactly. Yeah. Which is the difficult trade-off trade to find. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, I think that's... But smart people working on it. They really are. Yeah, exactly. I think so. Exactly. And I, th I know that we were thinking about, um, you know, those best practices and then, you know, what are some of the other barriers that might prevent, you know, th what are those missing puzzles that could possibly help protect the users? Okay. Um, if, if I could uh, give a couple of uh, a couple of advices to securely... Uh, uh, can we drop it like it's hot? <laughs> Celsius? Celsius, oh yeah. Man. <laughs> okay. so that was no pun intended. What happened? is Celsius? Uh, cel uh, yeah. Celsius is a crypto company uh, which holds your Bitcoin and your cryptocurrency and uh, allows you to provide you some services, yield, uh, swap, and this kind of services. And when you use Celsius, you give your money to someone else. And uh, yesterday they uh, announced us, they announced the world that in fact they are in an insolvency uh, situation. That means that you don't hold your crypto and uh, they, you might never see again uh, your crypto uh, if, if they were in, uh, in uh, Celsius. That's why I think like self-custody is the, the main, uh, the main um, advice I, I could uh, give to anyone uh, wanting to, to go in crypto. You wanted to say something yeah, I was just about Celsius? Yeah, so yeah. just to like frame this. This is essentially a crypto institution that took on 7 billion plus of people's crypto. And today they announced they are no longer processing customer withdrawals, which means you can't take your $7 billion out of Celsius. And until they decide at some point to allow people to withdraw, are they going to allow them to withdraw 7 billion? Maybe. Are they going to allow them to withdraw 1 billion? No, there's no control. And their terms of service say that they own the Bitcoin and the Ethereum and the other crypto assets that were put onto Celsius, mm. not the customers. So in the event of a bankruptcy, the creditors have the rights to those coins before the depositors. So that's something that's going to change. So yeah. who made that rule? So that, that's and how did they get away with having that rule? Celsius has lawyers and there's no yeah, regulation. Right. So it's just a wild west. We're still in a for wild now, west. Yes. Yeah. yes, for now. Yeah, but th for now. this yeah. is that, that is going to change. So Nexo yeah. is another company that's doing this sort of very similar business. And despite the market turning you know, very sour recently, Nexo is just fine. And that's because they ran their business in a different way than Celsius. So I think it is possible to do these businesses in a way that's ethical, in a way that I think prevents this sort of catastrophic loss. And there's a way to do it wrong. And I think that this is where legislation and the industry self-regulates to yeah. prevent this kind of stuff in the future. Yeah, but the best way to prevent this is, is to self-custody. Yes. You, yeah. you don't trust anyone else. You trust yourself. And as we say in crypto, not your keys, not your coins. This is something important to say. Yeah, so every single person that didn't have their money on Celsius doesn't have this problem. Right. Not your keys. Yeah. Not your coins. Not your current. That should be on a T-shirt somewhere. <laughs> uh, sure, sure it, it out. Yeah. <laughs> sort it out somewhere. And, and, and Sasha, anything to add to that? Um, I duly agree with what you said. Um, I think that self-custody, people adopt self-custody when they want to interact with the, yeah. the app ecosystem. Yeah. That's, the, that's the beginning. What, that's where the users start to use uh, self-custody. And that's what uh, centralized exchange don't provide for yeah. now. And... Uh, <laughs> I guess that uh, one of the remaining problem is also that, uh, I don't know about Ledger, but for MetaMask, uh, one of the most used ones right now, um, it's not that easy to understand for novice users. I had some of my friends wanted to use a DeFi protocol. Uh, I tried to... <laughs> People just <laughs> click stuff. They don't even read what they're clicking yeah. Yeah, anymore, yeah. right? But the main yeah. problem is also, yeah. hey, you got different chain IDs, and this one is testnet, this one is the mainnet, you have to send your coins there and use that. 
I guess there's a big, big uh, leap to make uh, regarding UX UI. Yeah, we are back to UX. When, when, yeah. you, when you sign a transaction, you need a way to understand yeah. what will be the, yeah. the output of this sign, this, con the, this consent. Yeah, and this, this, is a, this is a difficult uh, problem to solve. Yeah, yes. one of my friends just uh, went the, the same friend I introduced to uh, <laughs> DeFi, which was a bad idea, by the way. And you're <laughs> still friends with this person. Yeah, yeah, okay. that's uh, a <laughs> <laughs> topic in so progress. I mean, so th this is the thing, right? If you want like a really beautiful experience, you have to do a lot of the heavy lifting of translation. Yeah. When you're sending money to these DeFi protocols, you need a way to say, I'm sending money to Roger. And this is definitely Roger on the Solana mainnet. You need a way to do that. It can't be, I'm sending money to this very long string of characters, and if I type yeah. one thing wrong, I lose all my money. That can't be the better world. That's not better than traditional banking. It's just not. That's really, really relevant because what happened to my friend is that he, he thought he, he was using a DeFi protocol he used uh, once before, and basically it was the same website. It was a phishing yeah. website, and it just you know, uh, push the transaction. And basically, it was just sending his money to another person. And there was no way to find out, like, in, 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 unless you're used to using it, basically, there was no way for him to find out, A, hey, this transaction is different from the one I, I was using before. I, I think we'd all agree that, like, what people actually want is Venmo or Alipay or these, like, cash sending apps that are decentralized. And they don't have the same regulatory burden as the traditional financial world, mm -hmm. but they feel like these ultra yeah. simple apps. That's the holy grail. Yeah. And that's a lot of what we're trying to make. Back it to the point. UX. Yep. Exactly. Maybe that should be a t-shirt as well. <laughs> so thinking about that, ladies and gentlemen, um, we are going to take some questions from the audience. Uh, I'm just so going to be adding one last oh, thing. Oh, I guess oh yes, yes, <laughs> yes. We're here for another 12 uh, minutes. I was Good. mentioning it, but I think that... Um, Right now, uh, UX is not only about making it clear, translate what the transaction does, but yeah. really, uh, I, I was mentioning that before, but highlighting the more trustworthy and secure yes. project. Right yeah. now, like everything is neutral. Like uh, yep. yeah. it's like uh, taking your six years old uh, daughter drawing uh, of a tree and saying it's the same as the Bob Ross one. Basically, yeah. everything is on the same level. We could just like highlight the best project for a user, C still remain with the decentralization, with the possibility, with the access to everything, but just guide users. We cannot expect for users to make all the jar, to know all the things, to mm. to be scammed or hacked for two years and then be uh, and able to. And from your perspective, who should do that? Because <laughs> uh, uh, you're us, not going to do us it. Like, no, we won't do that. We are yeah, neutral. Yeah. We we just want to provide users with tools, allowing them to do what they want. Yeah. If, if they want to interact with a very complex and shady protocol, well, they can. Okay, so everybody remembers apps before the App Store? Yeah. Like, yeah. you remember loading phone apps? Snake. Yeah, you, you would load phone apps and you'd get it from some, like, random website and you don't know whether it's going to, like, lock your phone, you have to send some money somewhere. Then we have Apple with the App Store. And right. all of a sudden, mm. apps just work. It, it's a shop. And that's because they're, they're paying a fee mm. in order to have a human and algorithms review whether these apps are going to steal your money or not. Yeah. So that's, that's what we really need in crypto, but it's hard for us to get there. There's nobody in the ecosystem. It'll like get there, yet. boys. No, get It'll there. get there. And get you know, there. We are like at COGX always talking about thinking about how we improve the next 10 years. Uh, you know, think about the next 10 weeks in crypto is hard enough, let alone the next 10 months. So I'm sure we're going to meet one year from now and this discussion will be, you know, we're going to up the ante in this discussion. Uh, but before we kind of like dip too far into the future, uh, if anyone has any questions, there is this lovely uh, person here. Uh, is that Ian? Okay, he's got a microphone. So we want you guys to be interactive. We've had a really amazing conversation with these guys right here. So any questions at all coming in? I know that they're going on in your head and you're regretting there's no Slido. Thank you, gentlemen in the third row. To our left, we've got a question here. All right. Treat it like an auction. So. Hey, um, thank you. It's a really cool, really interesting panel. Um, could you go into a bit more detail about smart contract audits? Um, where you get to find them, who there are, like just outlining the process, really, um, for, the, for smart contract audits would be really helpful. This was on you, man. You. Yeah. <laughs> <Sasha>. <laughs> So you are Thank talking you. about finding new contracts or being sure that the contracts you found out is sure? Um, getting someone for, for my company to do a smart contract audit on our behalf. Well, step one, you got to wait eight months at this point. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it's hard. Um, you know, you want to talk about the organizations? Yeah, yeah it's really hard. Um, there's this new project that is really interesting in the auditing sphere, which is called Arena. Don't know if you've heard of it. 
It's really, really interesting, good uh, security experts in there. But truly, most of the projects are drastically the same. We forked a lot. So we recreate the same value. We audit the same value. And uh, what's, I think, uh, such a pity in this ecosystem is that we have to wait for these five or 10 best auditors to be uh, available. When you are developing on the other side, uh, you don't need to have a former Google developer if you want to do a landing page. So if you're doing a token, you can just go with a, a, an auditor that is used to audit tokens, and that will be fine. But the main problem remains the same, is that the community will only trust the most uh, reputable and most popular auditor. So right now, there are no like tips and tricks to have an auditor, the, the best auditor, the ones that the community will trust uh, in an efficient way. But that's also what I'm working on, so I hope to <laughs> have you as a customer soon enough. <laughs> yeah, and at the end, like auditing a, a smart contract is like auditing the security of some code, but there are a few differences. The, the, the first one is um, smart contract language is, is quite special. Uh, there, there is very few people in the world uh, which are uh, knowledgeable uh, in, uh, in Solidity, for instance, uh, mostly because it, this language exists only for a few years. So this is the, the, this is the first thing. Uh, the second thing is, like from an attacker perspective, this is, this is quite different. Like the adversarial thinking of uh, attacking some software is quite straightforward. We know the we know the threat. We know the threat model. We we know that uh, when when you have a user input, you you have to have a look to um, uh, buffer overflow when there is some crypto. There are some uh, cryptographic attack. When it comes to smart contract, uh, the smart contract execution depends on the state of the blockchain, and this is very difficult to uh, understand because you you enter in a threat model where there are some financial uh, aspect. Uh, if an attacker uh, start to uh, attack a liquidity pool, it will have like some uh, some impact on the smart contract itself. So it's it's a little more complex than than only auditing the security of some software because there are some some financial aspects which come into play. Fantastic question. Anything else to add? Yeah, I just want to say that um, we've had a lot of success with NCC Group and IO Active as well as Trail of Bits. Yep. Um, I would say of those, IO Active has the shortest wait at this point. Mm -hmm. um, but NCC and, and Trail of Bits, they're going to take like six months to put you on schedule now. Yeah, there are a lot of demands, a lot of people who want their uh, smart contract to be audited and very few uh, relevant uh, audited firms. Yeah, there's just not a lot of people who actually know how to do security. It's like one of the hardest things is like, if you're making a cryptocurrency, you have to hire people who know cryptography and distributed systems, and not just theoretically, but actually like in production. Mm. And the set of people who are doing that, who are not making, you know, like $5 million a year at Google is really small. Right. So it's, it's really hard to find great developers who can build this kind of stuff. But upskilling then. You can teach people, money. but it takes yep. a long time. Yeah, it's a long time. Yeah. You're running hackathons for that kind yeah, of stuff? Yeah, of course. Yes? Yep. You well, go to colleges, you know. Yeah, yep. by the way, we are, we are organizing an hackathon in uh, three weeks, I think, in Paris. So yep. I take the opportunity to invite you if you Sleeping if you bags under the desks included, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Mookie. Thank you for supporting Kayaks.